Um, so we're on the last chapter of the last chapter. I'm so sorry. We're on the um, sort of the last section of chapter one, um, Western hegemony and African studies. So it's a, it's a relatively short section. So I'm just going to go ahead and keep this waiting. Um, okay. So why isn't this working? Next. Okay. So I just like pulled out some things that like were covered in this section. Um, some things that like stood out to me or like jumped out to me. Um, like if there's like in the entire slide, um, things that like people like want to talk about that were included, please like <laughs> feel free at any time to like raise up your hand or just like talk. It's like pretty much, um, I'm not like, I'm not like professing, I'm not like, you know, in charge of anything really. So please just like feel free. Um, so this phrase where she says, it is clear that the West is the norm against which Africans continue to be measured by others and often themselves. And then she also says, sorry about the noise. She also says African experiences are really, inf really informed theory in any field of study. At best, such experiences are exceptionalized. And then she goes into the nativist versus anti-nativist argument, and she goes into the issues with negritude. Um, so anyone can just feel free to jump in, share um, their thoughts. Um, you agree, disagree, um, things are like you've been deliberating, things that you're struggling with in this section, um, well, like maybe struggling with things that like it's difficult for you to accept or agree with or like anything of that nature. Um, Can you say what pages these are from? Yeah, let me, let me pull this. Real quick. I guess you said it's the last it's the last section in chapter mm -hmm. one. So those at the writing Yoruba into English. Yes, thank you. Okay. Uh, no, I think this is before writing Yoruba into English. This is uh Western so Oh yeah, that's there right. There are two sessions um that we're covering here. So the first one is uh, West, uh, coming. Uh, I can give you the page number, but I don't. I wouldn't know what copy you have. Um, Western Hegemony African Studies. So thank you. I see okay. it. It's on page seventeen on my end. Yeah. So we we're starting from Western Hegemony in African Studies to the end of chapter one, which also includes writing your mind to English, propagating the West. Uh, yeah, if I may come in my, my, myself. Yes, please. Uh, actually, I can't raise my hand, so I'm going to have to. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, for me, it was quite an interesting section, you know, um, because it's always a thing that has bothered me to the extent in which there is Western hegemony in um, African studies. And it's funny how a lot of reactions actually are measured against, you know, still that paradigm or that architecture. Um, I think in previous sessions, I've mentioned that I, I wrote an article, um, which is on our website, um, about how, you know, you have a lot of assumptions about traditional African cultures um, that are not well researched and are based on what you know the West tells us in terms of how, um, uh, in terms of gender generally and how women are, uh, women's oppression is seen, um, lots of misconceptions and things that, that um, are more recent are taken to be tradition that are actually colonialist influenced. The extent is not even studies, even our cultures are <laughs> have westernized in a sense and then taken to be our cultures. So that that is also something I you know uh, notice from uh, from reading that. And one thing actually 
you, you get a lot of people who talk about being very good in Yoruba um, and they are nativists, if you like. <laughs> you find that the, the whole understanding is based on a Western um, paradigm. Uh, is talking about uh, uh, body hegemony, but I think generally the hegemony of course is cuts across everything. So for example, there's a way in which in translating names, um, uh, you find it's based on this hegemonic viewpoint on, on the Western viewpoint. So for example, there's, there's a name like Ola, which is a name I bear, Akinola. And, and people actually translate that as wealth. Um, because they see that from the Western perspective, this thing about wealth being important, sometimes they even translate it as money. Whereas the, there is another word for wealth in Yoruba, which is Ola. And Ola means um, a honored person. It's not necessarily wealthy. So that that's, uh, um, I'm just giving that as an example that it's quite widespread and the, the whole culture is infused with it, not just in the studies. Um, that's how serious the matter is. That's just my, my own contribution. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. I feel like personally for me, it's just so sad to watch. Um, like just even like in our interpersonal relationships growing up, um, I went too fast, growing up um, in like, you know, like sort of like our neo-colonial society in the home and like the things we aspire to and like the standards that we set for ourselves is um, like whiteness is the norm and like we have to catch up to that. We have to like from the names to simple things like our food and like then more complex things like gender it's like then how do we define ourselves like how do we escape western hegemony and <laughs> sometimes i just think it's funny people think like like we can escape um western hegemony without like addressing like fundamental things like capitalism or like colonialism and i'm just i'm just curious as to like how those people want to achieve that um so um that's just my own musings, but anyone have anything else? Like some new people have joined us, please um, feel free to raise your hand to um, contribute. And I know like negritude was, um, I don't know like if there's still like a, there's a, still like a huge like negritude movement um, right now in 2021. Like, I don't know if people still like, like use that as a framework or like, I don't know if people still like uh, referencing um, that movement, um, but if anyone like has anything, if someone has to to say in these in this section. I think someone unmuted themselves. Can you hear? Them? Hey, um, this is cheating. They them pronouns. I was gonna say that I don't know if there's like a continuation of the particular neck to movement, but I think the thing she highlights is still a continuation to today, which I think is like a product of like bourgeois you know, a class of folks who are clinging to the essence of culture in order to like obfuscate like class distinctions. And so um, like, I think recently I've been reading Amical, Amical Cabral um, and, you know, just talking about, you know, culture as a weapon, you know, I think um, the last person was just talking about how somebody could know Yoruba, you could know the native language, but that can also be utilized um, you know, as an imperialist or, or a colonial tool to oppress um, and exploit the native population. And so there's like a class of people who oftentimes, yeah, use culture in these ways that essentialize blackness or Africanness, you know, but I think what she's pushing for is that more scholars, and I think it gets to the next slide, but more scholars and more people to be documenting the day-to-day um, indigenous cultures and actually coming from, you know, indigenous culture from inside out, not from outside in and trying to compare. Yeah, it's just like they're still using the same European standards. So there's no decolonizing process to actually understand the, the endless, uh, you know, thousands of different indigenous cultures to actually inform what is or is not 
uh, you know, traditional, what is or is not indigenous. Yes, um, Emilka Cabral, he's just, yeah, culture is a weapon. Like, he's just so brilliant trying to get through him myself. Um, I was just reading something about uh, Museveni in Uganda, and um, one of the, it was, some, it was fiction, but it was about, like, one of the wars and um, the child soldiers there and how he takes advantage, like, exactly what you're saying. How he, like, he takes advantage of, like, knowing certain language or like knowing, like understanding colonialism, understanding capitalism, but like still being connected to um, the Acholi um, people in Uganda. And he sort of uses that to like, I wouldn't say like manipulate the people, but like have a control over like the political landscape in Uganda to get what he wants. So he's like satisfying, um, he's like satisfying the native bourgeoisie and the um, colonialists at the same time. like. It would be, it wasn't so evil, I'd say he was quite brilliant. Um, but um, if there's anyone else I don't think to add in this slide, I can just move on to the next slide. Um, okay, I'll just move on. Next. next. Okay, so African Feminist Scholarship, she kind of, she goes over this, in this. She says, when a number of African feminist scholars rush to characterize indigenous society as implicitly patriarchal, the question of the legitimacy of patriarchy as a valid transcultural category of analysis was never raised. The problem of evaluating Igbo and Yoruba cultures on the basis of their cultural other, the West, is that African societies are misrepresented without first presenting their positions. And <laughs> this is, I thought this was very interesting because I always see like debates on and offline, on the internet, off the internet. Um, and I, I feel like that last part, some people, I, I feel like the question that like, the question I get from the things that people say is that like the position of African society doesn't even need to be presented or is it even worth, um, is their position even worth like, um, representing or talking about or discussing people like draw from their lived experiences, indigenous people, people, continental Africans and African diaspora and say, well, this is like, this is what we live and we are Africans. And so we don't really see this. Like this is a mirror of our lived experiences and not to, and it becomes like strange. I'm not a scholar, so I don't, I don't, I'm not, I don't have that position, but for me as someone who's interested, it becomes strange because who am I to invalidate someone's, um, um lived experiences or you know say that it's it's certainly not irrelevant so I, i'm like that's one side i hear and but this other side that she's saying is of africans being misrepresented or african scholarship or indigenous ways of being being misrepresented um without offering their own positions is, is certainly like very valid and like that that's like oh someone's in the chat please um feel free to unmute yourself um anyone who wants to has anything to say. Um, someone, um, she offered a PDF for anyone who needs it in the chat. So please um, feel free to check that out. Um, anyone have anything to offer? It doesn't actually have to be particularly from this quote, just anything in the area of, I really just like went through the, the section like page by page. So, um, we didn't miss anything because we also want to make this Zoom like available for people who don't have access to the book or um, so they can have a comprehensive, um, I guess, understanding of like the book and what we're talking about. So I, I'm sorry, this might be a little bit slow <laughs> for some people. I just went through every page. I tried to go through every single page of the chapter and um, get things from there. Um, so anyone? has there are 10 people in the Zoom. So um where I can that okay. 
I just wanted to add, um, I'm like, look, I get, yeah, I think what I had said before came from right after that um, when she was pushing the need. And I guess that's kind of the preface for her, like diving deeper into Yoruba uh, culture and tradition um, to analyze like what was, you know, the what was the actual gender or lack thereof, um, you know, or arrange, social arrangements, you know, in Yoruba society. Um, but on that last page, she said, um, there's nothing wrong with Africans affirming their humanity and a common humanity with their nemesis, the West, um, the Westerners. This affirmation was indeed necessary. The problem is that many African writers have assumed Western manifestations of the human condition to be the human condition itself. To put this in another way, they have misapprehended the nature of human universals. So they've kind of like adapted or adopted this idea of universality that is like stems from Western society. Yeah, and like that's so dangerous. And but I can see how like that could be a conclusion someone might come to. I mean, it's such a uh, it's personal bias. So like colonialism, such a harrowing experience that you you want to be accepted into this. You want to be you want to be accepted. Like how could you not? Um, you you believe this? <laughs> you believe this will bring you? I don't know. Restore your dignity or or. Um, <laughs> bring you safety. Uh, okay, I'm gonna move on to the next slide. Okay, and then she goes on to talk about why modern African studies continues to be dominated by the West. Um, then she talks about that is the nature of the academy, especially its logic, structure, and practices. And then she says, as long as Africans take Western categories like universities, bounded disciplines, and theories for granted and array themselves around them, for or against does not matter. There can be no fundamental differences in scholarship among the among these protections of knowledge, no matter what their points of origin. And I feel like that's like what she said earlier and Kamar Shango said earlier as well. Like it, it doesn't matter um, for or against, as long as we're still operating from Western categories or Western conceptions of knowledge, we're just like going around in a circle. Um, but like anyone else have any, on this topic, I, I thought it'd be like a, top on issue why modern African studies continues to be done. And there's, I've heard um, people, continental Africans talk about how even diasporic Africans play into this or contribute to um, this problem. Like, you know, just because you're African, you know, just because you're black, you're still, you can still, you know, you can still be, I don't want to use a puppet, but you can still, you know, cause the same harm. You're not interrogating um, what you're doing or like this framework that you're working from. Um, and also like does every quote unquote like African scholar or like African person have like a responsibility to do this? Like, I guess my own like meta question is like, what are the ethics around um, knowledge production, if there are any, and how do like how do like people, how are scholars or like uh, people interested in knowledge, um, how are they like held accountable um, if they're going to like separate themselves from the masses of like working poor, like working class Africans in on the continent who have like further proximity to them, like wherever they are in whatever like ivory tower that they're, that they're like sitting in. Um, so I don't bear any like, <laughs> scholars like academics of the call or like just anyone who wants to who feels passionate about about the issue um wants to contribute hello yeah um hello yeah so yeah go hello. Ahead. Hello. yeah 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 on the question of 
how um, cultural is able to be um, African um, intellectual or say African um, academics in general. Because first of all, we need to understand that you know the, uh, the documentation of African culture was being done by those that are being colonized. You no, know, you know, for instance, we have people coming from you know, from um, from America who came back home to Africa and started interpreting um, African culture to the Western culture. You no, know, for instance, now you know we have um 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 what's it called a bishop called Bishop Abai Abai Crowder here in, in Nigeria, who was the one who translated you know, the Bible into the Yoruba language. You no. Know, in, in some aspects, you know, he, 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 I would try to use his own aspect as a case study in this sense, like, like realize that some certain words, you know, in the Yoruba language, we are being mis, uh, misinterpreted. You know, for instance, now, though, in the Bible, they will say, um, um, say um, the, our own issue, we have the issue is, 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 is one of the biggest deity being worshipped in the, in the Yoruba land. So in the Bible, you know, they misinterpret issue as Satan. So out of that context, you know, we still also realize that you know people try much as possible to document things on on the understanding of the West. So they are not trying to you know you know portray the world or portray portrait African society the way it is of African um of African making. What they are trying or what they are trying to do is that you know trying to you know Know, document African history to the to the to the Western audience. So over time, you know, Western um, colonization, you know, spread its own way of, of narrating, you know, um, the native culture. You know, for instance, now on the issue of gender, you know, the West China is able to justify um, 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 gender in the in the world sense from their own cultural understanding of what culture should be, not considering what culture should be. What culture is in the aspect of maybe in the aspect of 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 Yoruba tradition, in the aspect of you know, um, um the Mayans tradition or whatsoever, and also um um or you will also emphasize that you know, um what's it called? The Europeans try much as possible to justify things by the word sense rather than uh, justify things by by the word sense rather than um um what's called it. I'm trying to remember because um. I'll try to come back there. Like you know, Europeans try to justify their own understanding of, of culture. You know, they try much to spread it around in Africa. So that's one of the reasons they are facing. And like you said, if we can, you know, um, um, collapse capitalism, we need to collapse, you know, cultural imperialism all over us. We, uh, I was doing, um, um, I was doing some certain readings about what's called Edward Said. You know, Edward Said trying to to portray how Europeans, you know. At the one way or the other, trying to you know create an orient, uh, uh, orient um, 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 culture about how the Eastern people, you know, the the, um, the Arabians looks like. So the chairman is people like you know, you know, the kind of Arabian you see on TV are the one who are the Taliban's, you know, who are who are the one bringing the bomb, you know, who are the one terrorizing the world. But you know, people chairman is able to understand, you know, the, um, what's it called, the, uh, the Arabians from the aspect of um, terrorism, but not actually going there, you know, to see their daily life, to see their daily activity, to understand their culture, to understand their values. So in as much as we keep, you know, taking in the narrative of the West, you know, there's going to be a complication of, of an misinterpretation of culture. So that's my own, um, um, what's it called? Um, contribution for now, I'm here, sure. Hello? Hello, yeah, thank you so much. Someone else had their hand up. Oh, two people have their hands up. Someone's clapping. Oh, um, anybody have your hand up? Wait, I was supposed to stop right now. I wanted to take my time. Yeah, um, sorry, I, I was supposed to raise my hand, but sorry. Well, my contribution to that is that um, we should understand clearly that one of the major functions of colonialism or imperial domination is cultural domination too. Like it's a very, very um, serious tool in terms of reorienting negatively dominated people 
for them to interpret the world through the lenses of the colonizers. And when you have that kind of domination sealed and hammered in amongst oppressed people, then what you start having is institutions mirroring oppressive um you know frameworks or even how the oppressed start to define themselves see themselves and even start retrogressing backwards into inhumane and unhuman ways of you know um seeing themselves especially in the class society and what, what we have is you know this is the native intellectuals or colonized native intellectuals that have absorbed the Western ways of seeing things, of describing the world, their worldview outlook, you know, and they've become the mouthpieces of the new institutions on, you know, the African continent. And this is why you have them giving validity to Western ways of seeing things, defining things, you know, and how we Africans see ourselves. They are the mouthpieces of this um, imperial network on the ground on the continent you know and if there isn't a surgical understanding and surgical removal of these people that further imperial thoughts and imperial ways of doing things generally what we have is not only this backward way of seeing ourselves but it blocks the room for genuine dialogue and genuine ways of reinterpreting the way we're supposed to see ourselves like it, it blocks a positive or upward evolution of culture you know and since the continent is still being dominated by imperial forces and imperial thoughts patterns and world outlook it only follows logic that what we have will still be a domination of our institutions from economy to culture to religion and everything else on the board you know, so this is what one one of the things that I feel, you know, is uh, can explain why we have our uh, gender discourses or culture or uh, everything to be um, Western dominated. Yeah, thank you. Um, I guess I just also wanted to just talk about fear. I, I just like news about fear and how, um, how like I, at least I feel like fear is such a huge part of like the ongoing like process of colonization. And just how when I was a kid and when I was growing up, there was this, even to say the name fell out, like someone was having a discussion one day around me about how no one names your child fell out. Like even, even like, like just the proximity to like any sort of like radical animals or like energy is like such a taboo. Like people are, I know that like, we all, like we have nothing to lose but our chains or our, in our lives. And we, <laughs> But people are, I, I feel like people are genuinely terrified, like what this is, what I feel like Oyuri and Koyomi is calling for in this book is decolonization, like someone like someone said previously. And while like this is a logical, like this is what has to happen, people are terrified to um to 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 go there. People are terrified to ask these questions or to to, to, to be anywhere near anything that like upsets the power structure. And I don't know, I don't know how, <laughs> I don't know how if we're uh, ever going to overcome fear or have to deal with fear and also do what needs to be done. Cause there's, there's like, there's always an, an, an urgency. Um, Cause it's, you know, gender is, <laughs> people, people, people are losing their lives over gender because of gender. Or, you know, gender policing. Um, so, how, like, there's an urgency. How do we, how do we, like, reckon with like what needs to be done, like, and also um, deal with like people's real life genuine fears um, of how to like live their lives and how you know <laughs> how to how to live in society. Um, I think, uh, Karma Shaga, you unmuted yourself for a minute there. Oh yeah, when you're done. Sorry, I was trying to. Yeah, I'm done. 
comments because I, I think this is what you are saying and you know what others have said this is so very important and um, because what i'm looking at here so um, this thing about whether there can be any fundamental difference in scholarship um and does that signify a task for us you know for those who seek to be different you know because like i said earlier the scholarship around the um whether your and Hebrew society was patriarchal, how, you know, to the extent was um, a refusal to actually do proper scholarship, a refusal to actually do proper research, and just to take what the West told you um, and to see what you saw around yourself without interrogating the extent to which colonization had been responsible for those things. Um, so you, 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 you don't do the critical research that can bring out the truth about how people really, you know, in indigenous times, how people related. It's very important because, you know, we have, we constantly have these debates in groups like ours, for example, we have so many debates like, you know, homosexuality is not African and a uh, woman's place is in the home. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, and, and this this all talks about this. It's like a reading of trying to to be uh, see yourself. It's actually seeing yourself through Western lens, but you actually think you're doing the opposite. It's like um, uh, you know, um, and in fact, in this case, you know. In colonized times, it was obviously the case that the woman's place was in the home. And uh, when the colonialists came, they insisted that women must do needlework and uh, what do they call those things again? Those forces that home, was it home care or what do they call it? <laughs> I can't remember. But they, they have the particular, you know, courses that women must do and which was quite contrary to how women, at least in this part of Africa, where um, it was the colonialists that brought laws to, to ban homosexuality, to criminalize it, um, and so on. So, um, and what I, I don't, don't want to go, go through, you know, all of this, my, my real thing is, is that what does you know, we we found it, for example, a task like in our book to to do, you know, to try and enlighten about what is indigenous culture. But I think this, in terms of of the academy or whatever, you know, where a lot of these things become influential, it certainly seems to be a duty or a task for for those in there to to, to challenge this. I, I remember some professor Sophie well, Oluwale, a professor of philosophy, and she always used to talk about how the you know the men will always attack her, for example, say there's no such thing as African philosophy, um, you know, and going back to something I said earlier about their own, this so-called nativist understanding of language, they, they, they couldn't even get a proper translation for the word television. Um, I mean, she spoke speaks about that if anyone wants to know, and, you know, um, and, you know, she, she wrote a book, I think, African gender, myth, myths of gender, myths of gender or something like that. I um, can't remember the exact title, but it's a very good book that goes into what, you know, the so-called patriarchy, but then you look at the, the Yoruba myths and God, you know, about about the gods, um, which in this book, I think, is discussed about Odudu have been, you know, genderless, that's confused to someone who was trying to translate why, why would be referred to as female and lord and husband and thinking that these words lord and husband are gendered to be male <laughs> and in fact it's quite correct in, in you know everybody is oko oko me my my dear it's not actually my husband but oko is for everybody just simply means you know um simply means uh, husband you know it actually confused me growing up i, I hear women Telling you know other women or call me or I'm, <laughs> I don't understand you know it's the kind of like you, you start to get that 
it's 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 not gendered and like um so i gave the example of sofu sophie Oluwale because of her attempt to challenge what was um you know dominant in in the field um and and what she faced but but the, what our own responsibility is and responsibility of academics that we have it's, it's very important because it, it, is, it impacts the, the psychology of the majority of the people of, you know, and, uh, and people come into the understanding of what things could be like. That they, and it goes back again, finally, and so I'm going on a bit, to the point that she mentioned earlier about humanity. I think the actual truth is that what has been brought is actually inhumane, and yet it's been taken to be the, the foundation of of humanity and of course we must affirm our men humanity and by rejecting this inhumane things that that decide that you know some people are less than other people and people have certain positions and you know uh you know and so on so a lot of inhumane and, and wealth is the only thing that matters you know money is the only thing that matters all these things have to be challenged and they're actually quite inhumane and the societies we our, our ancestors knew indigenously before contact you know not completely but certainly with much contact with the west was societies that were, were actually on the foundation of humanity um anyway so let me let me stop there but there's a question there i'm opening out i, I hope that's that's clear thank you Uh, Chi, you have your hand up. I don't know if you want to jump in right here. Yeah, I was just I wanted to affirm just like um, the importance of us, you know, understanding just how you know how much of you know the the uh, rearrangement of you know uh, gender <clears throat> and sexuality and and uh, disability and all these things are part of this like colonial, you know, project. I think people oftentimes uh, try to view things as like a quote unquote primary contradiction or a secondary contradiction, but it's like all of these social structures were, um, you know, changing at the same time. And I appreciate you for bringing up the example of like Bible translations, because, you know, I had learned a while ago, I think, I don't know if, we're, I think we're saying different words, but eco, which is, you know, was just a, a practice, you know, in particular villages in, in Igbo land where um, uh, people could, a, a married, quote unquote married person could have an open relationship with another person with the consent of their partner. Um, but when the missionaries came, they frowned upon these, you know, eco, in, eco, eco institutions um, and, and pushed this idea of like, you know, sexual activities being only within a monogamous quote unquote marriage, you know, framework. Um, and, and in the translation of the Bible, you know, they, they translated this practice as, you know, concubine, adultery, fornic fornication and prostitution. And so just like in this process of colonialism, they are rearranging, you know, and, and, and creating the, 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 the structures that, you know, oppress, um, you know, trans women, trans femmes, gender and sexual variant uh, folks. And one thing I wanted to add on the culture part, I think culture and spirituality is one way that people um, have been, you know, returning to, to move forward, to really push back against this Western or European concept of human um, and really digging into indigenous spiritualities that, you know, were in many ways uh, these different um, ancestors or these different uh, uh, spirits, you know, represented or, you know, a, a appeared or, or were um, created in this like gender variant way, um, you know, and, and, and oftentimes we didn't see this disconnect between the, the nature and, and human, you know, but that type of human, uh, European human that literally is this idea that Europeans have a right to dominate and that Europeans can dominate over nature, I think is so anti uh Pra to the practices and the spiritualities that indigenous people have had. Oh yeah, definitely. I think 
So I know this is like a serious thing, but like I think Europeans are just so unwell because why do you want to dominate nature? It's like such a beautiful thing. Just relax um, and just like let it be. And like this is off topic, but I was re-watching um, Avatar, but I know it's fiction. And um, it just was so, was quite triggering actually. Um, like this beautiful like indigenous culture and they're just so connected to like it was just more painful knowing that like I would never have that I would never be this connected to myself or my community or have like cohesion with my community I just or, or nature I'm just uh, I'm just colonized now um yeah, but we can decolonize. I don't want to be a semester. We can decolonize our future generations. Don't have to suffer, suffer like sub be subject to colonialism and its whims. Um, anyone else have anything to say? Please, uh, on this slide, you can raise your hand. I'm just going to move on to the next slide. Sorry, just technical difficulties. Um, so I'm just gonna read this. Oh my goodness. This little thing, this little blurb um, from the section. She goes on, I feel like we've covered this, but she says, the point is that the foundations of African thought cannot rest on Western intellectual traditions. They have one of our, they have one of their endearing features, the projection of Africans as other and our consequent um, domination. I just think that it's, <laughs> I think that it's so interesting. Like, and then it's like for my brain is going into the whole like negative thing, like nativist versus like anti-nativist. I feel like, cause I saw a whole argument some, somewhere about like um, being Afrocentric. Um, I just feel like the moment you start like deviating from like Western intellectual traditions, like, even like let's just say philosophy the moment you tell people oh yeah i don't read um satcher i'm not reading kirkgaard i'm not reading like I don't, i'm not reading any of these people because they have nothing to offer me people start looking at you like you're intellectually bereft or something like you're um like you've committed like a cardinal sin of some sort and it's just why can why can't it be just that i'm not interested <laughs> and we're affirming my domination like why can't I just like why can't like that just be <laughs> why can't this just that be a thing like the process of decolonization is so tedious even in our own like community like people <sighs> people just cannot let go of like western intellectual standards um I feel like we've like sort of discussed this but if anyone like has anything to contribute I think this is on page, this is towards the end. Um, this is on page 20, 23, um, where she then goes on to be like, at the level of intellectual production, we should recognize that theories are not mechanical tools. They affect, some will say, determine how we think, who we think about, what we think, and who thinks with us. Some scholars, sometimes scholars seem to forget that intellectual tools are supposed to frame research and thinking. And as long as the ancestor worship of academic practice is not questioned, scholars in African studies are bound to produce scholarship. It is not focused primarily on Africa for those ancestors. Not only were not non-African, but hostile to African interests. The foundational question of research in many disciplines are generated in the West. A, re a recent anthology entitled African, Africa and the Disciplines asks a very Western-centric and ridiculous question. What has Africa contributed to the disciplines? Um, the more important issue for Africa is what the disciplines and practitioners of disciplines like anthropology has done to Africa. And on this note, I remember uh, taking like a West African art class in college and 
my professor um, being the one to curate the um, African um, exhibit something in DC and her getting like so much pushback from her um, from her supervisor and people who like she was working for because she like dared to ask that particular question like how the formation of like certain disciplines are only possible off the domination of like indigenous people <laughs> and so and her like refusing not to interrogate to let them you know just skate by and her just interrogating her own like discipline and like the work the quote-unquote job that is like of people going around quote-unquote documenting other people's like indigenous traditions um and like she got a lot of resistance for that but that's just by the by um to no one let me see if anyone has their if anyone has their hand up um no okay i'll just move on to the next slide So, right, and then she says, the point is that Africa is already locked in an embrace with the, embrace with the West. The challenge is how to extricate, extricate ourselves and how much it is a fundamental problem because without this necessary loosening, we continue to mistake the West for the self and therefore see ourselves as the other. This is, <laughs> I feel like this is like the biggest hurdle um, for us as this. I'm just thinking of how we, like, we have, like, <laughs> two weddings, two weddings, like, when people are getting married, we have, like, quote, unquote, the white wedding, which is we call the white wedding, and you have the traditional wedding, and the, the white, like, you have the traditional wedding first, and then you have the white wedding, and so the white wedding gives validation to the marriage, which I'm not going to go in a whole rant about marriage is ridiculous in and of itself, but um, the fact that <laughs> we need the validation of the white like wedding for the traditional marriage is just like but like people don't <laughs> people don't like see any issue with that we're just like yeah we're going to have two weddings we're going to call our clothes native clothes we're going to call them colonial masters um and, like all of this is the norm so i'm gonna stop um ranting now anyone has anything to contribute to add? Yeah, yeah. Um, this embrace that Oyeroke talked about is, um, we should understand that it comes from a place of dominance, a place of power. And this embrace is by force. And what makes it unfortunately valid and ever present on our continent is this colonized um, rulers or the bourgeois leadership or um, rulers that have now taken it upon themselves because of their class interest to reaffirm exploitative um, to reaffirm a exploitative order in the uh, on the continent and when you affirm exploitative order the things that come with it the barrage of things that come with it which is uh, all the things that your colonial overlords have told you are the ways of seeing yourself, have told you are the ways of conducting business, have told you are the ways of even seeing or interpreting or having your own world outlook, makes you hammering their institutions, makes you hammering all the things that they were doing here by their standing army or by force. So this embrace, even have, after they physically left, in quotes, now we see the bourgeois leadership continuing this and it makes it hard for us to discard that extrication that she's talking about will be very hard to happen because we still have native colonizers on deck on the continent now and without getting them off it will be very hard to remove ourselves from that embrace and chart a new course to the point where we have to, you know, um, maybe have new educational curriculum 
or um, new courses in the university to change our mind or read ourselves off this way of thinking. You know, so it's very important to know that decolonization must happen or decolonization must be that sustaining force. If we're going to keep pushing for this change, we should take the colonization seriously such that what we come up with, the new ways of thoughts that we are experimenting or coming up with would have a stay, will have staying power such that, you know, it won't be like we'll be doing it in a clandestine way or being criminalized for our views, all these kind of things. Like we have to push it to the logical conclusion of having a whole new society that can allow the birthing of these new ways of seeing ourselves, gender, thoughts, economics, pattern, government, and all that, you know? So that's it, decolonization is a key factor. My summary is that decolonization is a key factor that allow what we're talking about to see the light of day. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. Great to see the light, light, light of day. Um, Chi, you wanna go ahead and unmute yourself? Um, yeah, I was just gonna add, um, uh, or I appreciate the class distinctions and I'm thinking of an example of um, like in my village um, back home uh, during the NSARS protests, uh, you know, folks had burned down the police station. And then, uh, you know, fast forward the, these folks in the diaspora from the particular town that I'm from, rather than, you know, we're in the middle of pandemic, rather than, you know, fundraise for other things or build the infrastructure to, to, to deal with issues folks are dealing with, they fundraise in order to um, rebuild the police station. And then, of course, a couple months ago, the folks there burned down the police station again. And um, I think it just shows, you know, kind of to what her point was, you know, a couple pages to go around, like not even going in to assume, you know, what is a particular culture, what is a particular ethic that people are practicing. And I think uh, that it is from, you know, the more margins and the grounds that people are creating, you know, all these different cultures and, and resisting the dominant culture. But there's this class of people who uh, get to control the narrative and get to control, you know, how it is that they, um, believe that Africans or different groups of people are operating. So I think even pushing back against that and, and returning to, you know, the day-to-day, -day, what in the day-to-days -day of how people are, are creating culture and living, how does that align with the type of world uh, that we're already imagining? Someone's in the chat. Let me think. Uh, just links to the previous sessions if anyone wants to check them out. Yeah, the, the native bourgeoisie there and the, the bourgeoisie in general, our so called confrater class, were quite, um, were quite dangerous. I remember watching this Sankara documentary where they're like, he, he instituted this thing where like all the public officials had to wear clothes made by. Um, made indigenously by Burkina Bay and <laughs> the native uh, bourgeoisie um, when they'd wear the clothes to work and then they'd go out and like when they get to work and have their suits and tie and like western things um, waiting for them so they could change into them um, <laughs> and I just these people are just so like I, they just have to go like I so, like not like I don't like um she's she's inciting violence, but like I mean <laughs> they just they just have to go. Um anyone else like have their hand? And I think like what's worse is like I don't know how much grace to give um the like, the African middle class or the African bourgeoisie because I, I wanna be like I don't want to like absolve them from the harm that they're doing, but it's I, I don't know if it is I can say like some of them are they don't they're not even aware of how much harm they're causing or like the the the, the environment they're fostering um when they do things like this like when they were advocating for sanctions or just like I don't know and I don't I don't know I I, I don't know um okay I'm gonna I'm going to move on this is a relatively short chapter so I think there are two more slides left. Um, uh, 
so we're done with that section of Western hegemony and African studies. And the next she, it's about writing Yoruba into English, propagating the West. Yoruba scholars write with the West about the Yoruba. <laughs> it's even in, I feel like even in the, um, even the way like we refer to ourselves in the present, in the presence of like, um, there's like for like the the African bourgeoisie, there's always this like the separation. Yes, it's like the class separation. Like there's always this like there's also like that huge cultural separation. Always this pointing of like looking like oh we oh I'm not them. Like they have to assure the colonialists that oh I'm not like them. Like I'm <laughs> I'm fully colonized. I'm I'm like you. I'm not like them. They always have to like even like that distance is already there, but they always have to like solidify it um, by writing about, you know, at least that's just how I see it. Um, I'm gonna mute myself and move on to the next slide. Okay, she says, the lack of appreciation that language has carried with it, the world sense of a people, has led to the assumption that Western categories are universal. In most studies of the Yoruba, the indigenous categories are not examined, but assimilated into English. And I feel like we talked about this with the naming um, in, in, um, in the cultural practices, um, just like they're like, it's just so violent. They're looking for a devil in Yoruba, like, in Europe, like religion, it doesn't exist. So they they label issue issue as the devil. Um, it, it's just so it's just so damaging. I personally know people who have um, issue or things with like Yoruba um, things. Uh, you know, gods in the Yoruba pantheon as their prefix or their last names, and they have changed it um, to suit like to be more um to suit like western areas because they're just there's such a negative um there's just so much negativity is to join to it so when things are like so many things are like lost in translation which they shouldn't even be translated in the first place um but yeah um anyone have anything to contribute um in this section um or just any like grievances, <laughs> like it doesn't have to be like, you could just like, you can just rant like any grievances you have against just the challenge um, that you might encounter in, in your own like indigenous languages in contrast with like English or like other European languages. Um, okay, so I'm gonna need so I'm gonna shut up now. Yeah, I, I think, um... Well, I think I've made <laughs> some of the things that I said earlier make reference to some little bit about my own frustration with a lot of um, misunderstanding about language. But I think there's a point that she mentioned about spirituality earlier. And I think it actually, you know, you see within the spirituality actually how different, like, for example, you know, Yoruba and, and Igbo and other, you know, at least West African. Um, cultures were from the West, though they were now redone to make them similar to the use of language um, in the case of uh, Ishu and um, even in, in, in Igbo culture. Um, there's, I can't remember what the devil is <laughs> now, but there's the same scenario. So, um, but you see, you know, you know, for example, you know, with the mention about Odidua, um and the confusions about gender there and how to translate um there's a lot that you know that i've come across in terms of um the the, the spirituality and um, one that actually has always intrigued me is uh the traditional uh, indigenous house as a spiritual um uh belief which is called uh bori um, I'm not sure if people are familiar with that, um, which, you know, in, uh, actually, you know, uh, gender, I think, 
it was gender fluid and there was uh, cross dressing and and it, it's the thing about the spirit being predominant and if you remember we uh, uh, saying you know the west fix certain things viewpoint and you know certain things as, as foundational you know in traditional indigenous african culture other things were rather than just the physical or the body you know and the the, the spirits in this sense is, is bodiless and it's genderless um actually that that also brings me like a friend of mine who's Igbo, you know um told me that in, in Igbo land you can have reincarnation and uh uh where the it's a, a different gender that reincarnates into a present body you know a male female gender can reincarnate into a male body and that that is that people had you know so again it goes back to what our scholars are doing to bring out what is actually quite rich in terms of the difference that has been driven out through language by the crime of language um assimilated into english uh, it's 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 really horrendous and uh and really has to be challenged to all levels um i think all of us have been have been indoctrinated into this um so yeah that's that's my own rant <laughs> No, thank you. Um, that's so true. Even I, I, I think to myself, even being aware of the indoctrination doesn't like, <laughs> it's so sad. It doesn't like stop it from happening in taking like an extra precaution to check myself every day about things I, things I, I took for a fact or knew I, I thought to be true, um, or, you know, not true. Um, and just, I think this whole thing about bodies is just so, um, I remember like reading something in I think Variety or something where Akweke Mezia had done, uh, she, she did a spread where they, sorry, they did a spread where they talked about um, the, the sort of like reaction that their parents gave them when they, they wanted to, you know, make some alteration to their body. And I just, and I, <laughs> and I just, I was, I had like so like mixed emotions because I just was like they have every right to do whatever they want to their body and understand their body how they want how they understand it and this um this um what's the, this uh this sort of this claim and I, and I blame I blame like Judeo Christian that thought uh, whatever I blame Christianity for this but this like this claim of the body being this thing is just uh, it's it's not a fact it's not it's not like <laughs> it's not written in stone. The body is, you know, people can rise from the dead. People can can even the even the the, the Igbo concept of, of your chi being being with you. I remember trying to talk to um, <laughs> some family members about my own chi and trying to understand um, <laughs> that, and they're just so um, they just so they were. I think they were partly repulsed by the idea of of me like trying to explore that, and they just they had they have taken. I remember someone telling me Jesus is my my Lord and Savior, and I I was confused. What is that? They've taken Western categories to be an absolute fact. You can only under like it's 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 such a sad thing for me personally. Like you to only be able to understand yourself through this other. Like it's just in in, in our indigenous understandings are just. Like it, it only becomes. I'm trying to read this book called like performing um, indigeneity to really understand this performance that we get into. That's like that's the only time when we 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 sort of like reckon with our our ways of being is like when when I feel like when there's stakes for for the our our, uh, our middle class upper middle class when there's money involved and they remember that oh they're African oh, oh this is how we. This is how we do it. This is how we, and it's just, I'm just like, come on. Like, you're only interested in this for capital. Um, but let me stop ranting now. Um, anyone have anything else to to contribute? Um, I just uh, move on to the next slide.
And this is the this is our last slide. Um, and I feel like we sort of like I always <laughs> I always try to like make some sort of structure. But I love how the conversation always like carries and goes around itself, and like people just talk. And by the time we get to the last slide, we've already discussed <laughs> everything already. Uh, but it's so wonderful. Um, and but this last blurb is. She says, the lack of appreciation that language carried with the, the world sense of the people has led to the assumption that Western categories are universal. In most studies of the Yoruba, the indigenous categories are not examined, but assimilated into English. And I feel like we talked about this, especially with um, Bishop Pajai Crowder. And I remember when I was younger and people would say in church or whatever, like, oh, he was the first person to, and I remember like being weirdly very proud of that <laughs> and just not really having any like, uh, not seeing anything wrong with that, being, you know, very proud and people were very proud to be, oh yeah, he was able to um, assimilate, you know, into translate this into English. And I'm like, what are, like, what are you doing? And I think that for me, like I'm looking at this quote and it says the, the assumption that wasn't, like, I think that she's given, she's given like, she's given like Europeans or uh, the West a lot of like grace in this because I feel like that is, <laughs> I feel like we talk about this here, right? like, but that's the essence of like colonialism to assert yourself as the one, the one that we should aspire to. Like they don't, <laughs> they don't assume, like they just, they know, like they know that they are the standard that we, that we should, like we should measure ourselves in terms of everything. And they don't, they don't give it a second thought at all. Like, and we don't give it a second thought as well, at least like unless we're trying to decolonize, um, which we are. Um, with any, this is the last slide. Um, this is like a relatively short um, section. She talks about also in the section that Oba, which means ruler, non-gender specific in Yoruba has come to mean king in Yoruba discourse, whatever the historical time period is symptomatic. Um, and she talks about Odudua here as well. She says in the, his discussion of the historical records regarding the person of Odudua, he writes, taken together, existing genealogically or sex based in Odudua, do not and cannot on their own take us far in any attempt to definitively fix his position vis a vis other heroes, kings, or legendary figures. Obviously, as, even as a Bayami, the claims fixing gender identity, he does so with the help of the English language like. <laughs> and then she goes on to say gender as an analytic category is not at the heart of contemporary Yoruba discourse, yet very little has been done to untangle this web of Yoruba English mistranslations. Gender has become important in Yoruba studies, not as an artifact of Yoruba life, but because Yoruba life past and present has been translated into English to fit the Western pattern of body reasoning. Um, someone has their, she has their, their hand up. I'm gonna mute, my, mute myself now. No, go ahead, because that's the part that I was like, wanted us to read, like those last two paragraphs, I feel like are really good. Okay, so we're going to keep going. Um, this pattern is one in which gender is in the present, the male is the norm, and the female is the exception. It is a pattern in which power is believed to inherit in maleness in, it, in and of itself. It is also a pattern that is not grounded in evidence. Based on the review of the existing literature, it does not appear that Yoruba scholars have given much thought to the linguistic divergence of Yoruba and English and its implication for knowledge production. This is an issue that will be explored in subsequent chapters. Different modes of apprehending knowledge yield dissimilar emphasis on types and the nature of evidence for making knowledge claims. Indeed, this is this also has implications for the organization of social structure, particularly the social hierarchy that undergirds who knows and who does not. I have argued that Western social hierarchies such as gender and race are a function of the privileging of the visual over other senses in Western culture. It has also been noted that the Yoruba frame of reference is based more on a combination of senses anchored by the auditory. Consequently, the promotion of African studies and concepts and theories derived from Western mode of thought at best makes it difficult to understand African realities, that's for sure. At worst, it hampers our ability to build knowledge about African societies. Wow. <laughs> Every time I read this, it's just so depressing. <laughs> um, but anyway, yes. You can go ahead, Chi. I'm, I'm going to mute myself now. I know I've been talking a lot, so if there's other folks who want to chime in, I can wait. 
no, no, I don't, I don't have a problem with it. And anyone who wants to, anyone else wants to jump in? Uh, yeah, I just, I just wanted to, I mean, I wanted to emphasize um, the part where she says, um, I've argued that Western social hierarchies such as gender and race are a function of the privileging of the visual over other senses of Western culture. Um, and just like, I think, you know, um, been engaging a lot of um, like black trans feminisms and just like how folks are, you know, directly tying ableism to trans misogynoir and anti-blackness. And, and, you know, sh obviously she's not, further, you know, uh, dissecting cisness, but still is dissecting the concept of the body and the body equaling, you know, the value um, of production that we have in this like capitalist, you know, imperialist system. And I think that, you know, has to continue being uh, something that we push back against um, the bioessentialism and also, you know, even in the organization of social structure that's created a social high hierarchy even when the, it, within the concept of gender there is you know social hierarchy and so also moving away from like flattening gender analysis as just like a woman question you know and woman meaning a uh, woman oftentimes meaning cis woman but like even within uh bodies like how are some bodies you know uh, uh valued in other bodies and so yeah I appreciate um uh that I think is still relevant to you know 40 50 years later around uh, the, the usage of, of, of the body to, to make sense of the world. And then also the, the visual, even though she says auditory, which I think, you know, I think wanting a world in which like there's endless ways that people can per be perceived and experience, you know, uh, information and not just like one way that is just visual, which is um, ableist. Yeah, thank you so much. Do you, um... Do you have like any, rather than anyone you could recommend that you, you were talking about that? I'm thinking, I'm looking at the Venn diagram and, and then ableism and trans misogynoir and any one that like, any like uh, material, <laughs> I don't know why I'm forgetting my words, that really delves into that. So at least I can further understand just that, that connection. Do you have any like recommendations on that topic? Yeah, I can drop a couple articles. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, anyone have anything else to add um, in this last section? This is the last, well, we're, we're at the end of chapter one. Um, Yeah, I'm just, <laughs> I don't think anyone actually wants to, except for people who are doing the work of decolonization. I don't think anyone's interested in building um, knowledge about African societies. Like people might even ask what's the utility in doing such a thing. Um, yeah, anyone have any? Final. Oh yeah, well, please check out the, the chat. Um, thank you so much. She has dropped some resources for us to check out. Um, anyone have any final words and words in this chapter? Um, we're going into chapter two in our next reading. Um, where she talks about your cosmology and social cultural institutions and in all your Yoruba society and tries to dissect that world sense that she's been talking about. And I I can't wait. She definitely talks about the uh, the Oko and Aburo and that you were talking about earlier, Kamar Um It definitely confused me too as a child. I was always wondering what that 
why they were calling women um, Baka, um, quote unquote women. Um, but yeah, I guess this is if, if anyone doesn't have anything else to contribute. Chi, I can tell if you have your hand up again or just from the other time. Um, okay. Um, okay, this is, we come to the end of our session. This is relatively quick. This is a short session. Actually, yeah, this is the end of, Anyone have any final notes? Um, anything to add? Anything that we, we thought that I did not put on the slides? Any notes for me as a moderator for next time to things you particularly like to see on the slide, slides? Or um, because we want people to go on YouTube or be able to check the slides out and have um, a, a comprehensive understanding of what's going on in the book chapter by chapter, trying to make this book accessible to people. Um, so um, anyone have any notes or comments on the book, on the chapter? Discussion question on the slide and page numbers. Okay, thank you. Um, gonna put that, um, take that in. Um, anyone?